Word of prayer. Uh, Rob, you want to pray for us? Sure. Uh, good Father, we uh, give you all the glory for uh, using the word and uh, for the Amen. Thank you. All right. So we have been doing the series on uh, exegetical fallacies, right? So we are now uh, getting to the part where we are uh, going to look at, we're going to look at two uh, sections. We're going to actually look, look at four different uh, fallacies uh, today, and I think we're going to do two or maybe three next week. Uh, and a lot of it is because they kind of repeat themselves, um, but I do want to, uh, for us to take, um, to be careful with them, especially because remember what our, uh, our for, from the very get-go, we've called this series Accurately Handling the Word of God uh, after uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, right? We want to be diligent when we deal with Scripture. Uh, we want to cut it straight, remember, ortho to male, what that means, something straight. And the reason why we are going through exegetical fallacies is that we want to look at error uh, so that we can actually ma make sure we are not uh, making those mistakes. And, and in the past, we looked at proof texting, remember? And what was proof texting? What was proof texting? Yeah, it's either a half a verse or a few verses where you kind of put them together out of their context and just say, this is, I want to talk about this. Uh, and then you, you use that, right? Uh, and we said that, that the biggest problem with that is it doesn't respect the author's intent on the text. And the same thing we talked about when we talked about uh, isolationism, taking a passage out of context, we did the same thing, right? We those remember we I showed you T-shirts and really cool stuff that people sell with verses, but the verses don't actually mean what people think they mean. Why? Because they're out of context. Uh, then Kevin uh, talked about redefinition and rationalizing, uh, right? Taking passages. Yeah, wow. Well, of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah, of course, we, we want to base everything on Scripture. I think mo most of this, when we take verses out of their context, just to support good things that we want to say, but the passage is not saying that. So our answer to that is we find passages that actually say what we, what actually let the passage speak by itself and not find a passage to say what we want to say. Let the, let the Bible speak for itself. Um, and this is why it's so important for us to look at the whole context. Um, uh, even last week we talked about spiritualizing, right? And what was spiritualizing? To make sure you guys are paying attention to me. What was spiritualizing? And do we ever do it? Inserting a hidden meaning to the text. Yeah, so it's inserting a hidden meaning to, to the text, right? Looking at a passage, especially we dealt with a lot of the Old Testament, and we look at a passage from the Old Testament, a story, and we would just say, well, see, and, you know, the walls of Jericho are the walls of, you know, uh, our own lives. You know, Jericho is a place we want to get to, uh, but it's walled. And, and that's not what the Bible says, right? That's not what the passage was about. The passage was about a real city called Jericho, and real walls that God in his power brought down uh, through the use of some crazy you know, stuff. Remember, we talked about that. So this morning, I wanted to look like uh, uh, two categories with, with two errors each. The first category is called what we, we can call um, over-literalizing scripture. Over-literalizing scripture. 
Um, and we're going to look at two errors. And two errors that you might think to me, oh, I would never do. Uh, and, and maybe you wouldn't. But you know what? Just because you wouldn't do them, that doesn't mean that they're not alive out there. Uh, and over-literalizing scripture has two errors. One of them is called letterism, and the other one is legalizing. So it's letterism and legalizing. Just imagine you read a headline, lions, mole, bears, right? Someone reading this headline, out of context, might conclude that a bunch of irate lions viciously attacked a group of bears, right? However, you and I know better, right? Why? Well, because we know sports. And given the context of sport, we know that the Detroit Lions probably score a lopsided victory over the Chicago Bears, right? Why? Because newspapers kind of require the readers um, some basic rules of interpretation when they write their headlines. Uh, in order for people to understand that, look at these are just from the last uh, couple of years. Look at this headline. Typhoon rips through a cemetery. A cemetery. Hundreds dead. <laughs> or this one. My, this is my favorite of all. I'm reading it second, but it's my favorite of all. Red tape holds up new bridge construction. <laughs> Another one from the LA Times. Kids make nutritious snacks. <laughs> I don't know that. This is another one. I really like this one too. Chef uh, throws his heart into helping feed the needy. <laughs> Yuck. You see that? We all laugh. Why? Why, why did you laugh, Nate? Because the literal interpretation is wrong. Yeah, exactly. Because you know immediately, hey, a chef throwing his heart into helping feed the needy means what? What does it mean? Passion. He's throwing passion. Or kids make nutritious meals. We all know that no one's eating any kids, hopefully, right? Or red tape holds up new bridge construction. What is red tape? Bureaucracy, right? We, we understand that. But just imagine someone who's learning English for the first time and reads that. Is it red tape? What kind of red? I need to get this. Is this gorilla tape? What kind of tape is this holding up this? Why? Well, because newspaper writers, they know that they kind of require that you would understand this, right? So does the Bible. The Bible requires that you would understand when it uses certain language and that you're not going to take it literally, right? And when you do, <laughs> bad things happen, right? Uh, look at what Richard Mayhew said. By the way, Richard Mayhew's book on how to study the Bible is a tiny book. Um, I thought it was out of, in out of print, but it's not. Actually, you can find it. I think it's like $8. Uh, but it's really helpful on all of these fronts. Um, I based a lot of my lectures on this, and I, I actually have been reading that book for, for many years. Um, not because it's so long, but I've been rereading the book. It's very helpful. Uh, look what he says here, and after lions, uh, in your, in your uh, notes, after lions, uh, mole bear. Um, Derek, you want to read that for us? Use this basic rule of thumb. Interpret the Bible normally, like any piece of literature, while allowing for speech, figures of speech and special kinds of literature, such as poetic or prophetic. See, you interpret the Bible normally, just like anyone would interpret anything. We talked about the text message, right? We've been doing this pretty much every week. If I say we meet at 8 o'clock, we're meeting at 8 o'clock. Uh, unless you find uh, some kind of poetic or prophetic literature or a figure of speech. And the problem is that the fallacy of letterism and the fallacy of, uh, of legalizing um, how, what they, they've done to figure, figurative language, they've said, well, no, the Bible says this, and it means this. Uh, one of the first letterists of the Bible 
is a man named Nicodemus. So why don't you turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Taylor, I want to have you, have you read verses 1 through 4. Is that okay? All the way in the back, yeah, we, we can hear you. You've got a booming voice. Yeah, please. John, Gospel of John, chapter 3, 1 through 4. Now, look at this. Thank you, Taylor. Look, look at this. What is going on here? Let's talk about it. What is going on here? Nathan, what is going on? Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. He's thinking, wait a second. Um, I'm old. He probably wasn't that old. Um, I think the older I get, I think you're probably a young guy. <laughs> but he's thinking, how can I be born again? Now, Jesus is not telling him he needs to be, go back to his mother's womb, right? Uh, but he is the first letter, letterist that we find uh, in the New Testament again, right? Uh, he's not, because we're going to see how this was very normal uh, for Jews to take every letter of the law and try to follow it uh, to the nth degree, but yet their heart was far away from the Lord, right? Um, so this is what letterism is. It's finding some kind of um, figure of speech. Jesus is talking about spiritual birth. Now, I say, I say um, I, do you think that Nicodemus should have known he was speaking about the new spiritual birth? Who said Yes. 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 What in the Old Testament gives us the idea of the new birth? Yeah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. So he should have known this, right? But he forgot about that. Um, and he's like, well, let's talk about me being old, going back to my mother's womb. It's impossible. My mom is no longer with us, so how am I going to be born again? Um, well, um, Jesus kind of explains to him, and he actually says to him, hey, this second, you're, you're the teacher of Israel, and you don't know? I remember he sort of confronts that. Um, well, that's letterism. Um, look at the, uh, if you go to the next page here, in the uh, definition, letterism ignores figures of speech and draws wooden literature, literal conclusions that leads to serious errors. Um, think of the metaphors in the Bible, right? Um, Jesus is the way. Like, we don't think of Jesus as a way, right? No one in their right mind would think that. Oh, Jesus is a door. We know that, right? Oh, yeah, no one in their right mind would say, oh, yeah, he actually looks like a door. He's got hinges. No, like no one would say that. But however, you look at um, bad theology like soul sleep, right? And... Does anyone know what soul sleep is? Hopefully no one subscribes to it. Yeah, Noah, what is soul sleep? Uh, pretty much when you die, like the lights go out. Yeah. Do nothing, and then you wake up on like Christmas Day. Yeah, that's true. So you, when you die, a believer or an unbeliever, your soul goes to sleep. You shut down. And you're gone shutting down until the, day, the last day when you're either judged and put in hell or you are uh, in heaven. And this is a pretty prominent view. I, I actually was reading about it. I thought that just like, you know, people out there believe this, but this is very prominent. And they hold on to two passages. Um, this, someone uh, find John 11, 1. And the other one, Arthur, can you find 1 Thessalonians 4.13? Um, Jeremy, can you find uh, 
John 11, uh, 11, please. It's John 11, 11, not John 11, 1. John 11, 11. Whenever you have it, just read it. Okay, so they would say, you see, Jesus himself said that Lazarus was asleep. So obviously, he knew, if, you know, if someone would know about soul sleep, it would, be, it would be Jesus. Jesus didn't say he died, or he ceased to exist, which we know that a soul doesn't cease to exist. Uh, but he said he was asleep. Um, Arthur, can you read uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13? Yeah, so that's another passage. You see that, you know, Paul says, those who have fallen asleep. You can think of other passages, right? The one when Stephen fell asleep, right? After he was, you know, after he was being stoned to death and he fell asleep. Uh, so this belief says, you see, that sleep there is a literal sleep. Um, and it is that belief, like Noah said, right? That you are asleep, your soul is asleep, you're shut down until the resurrection or until judgment day. Um, however, this is not, uh, this is not, um, this is actually not a biblical way of looking at it. Why? Because there are very, various passages that deal with death and they talk about sleeping. Um, uh, and other, there, there's other passages that say that the moment we die, we face judgment. Hebrews 9 says that. Um, the, the same Paul says, and I think it's 2 Corinthians, let me see if I have it here, yeah, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 6, and Philippians 1, 23, that when you are absent from the body, you are present with the Lord, right? So if you die today, hopefully not, but if you die today, you will be present with the Lord. You're not going to be sleeping for however thousands of years, hoping to be awakened in the resurrection or in the... Uh, or to be judged to death. But this is a huge issue. Um, maybe not in our circles, but it is a very big issue. And it all stems from these verses that say, you know, death equals sleep. And they created this full-blown theology over this. I'll give you another example of this. Um, um, there are... Um, this is more fringy than, than soul sleep. There are, there are um, and this is a heresy, there is um, a strain out there that believes that God the Father um, is actually like a humanoid. Uh, that he is, yes, he's God, fully God, omniscient, omnipotent, everything, but that he has a, a body. And why do they get this? Well, look at this. I have the notes there. Well, God has arms. The Bible says, God has a right hand. He has a face. He has eyes. He has mouths. He has a mouth. He, he has nostrils. So therefore, the Bible can't lie, right? So God has human body parts. I mean, he is, he is a human-like creature. Now, some people say, well, no, that's Jesus. But we would say, no, no, that's that you don't have to explain that way that way. How would you explain this? So when, Jesus, when the Bible says that God, you know, saved Israel with an outstretched arm, how would you explain that? It's poetic? Yes. What else? Figurative. Figurative. What does an outstretched arm mean? Strength, right? How about when you say that uh, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere? Does he have an eye or eyes? What does that mean? He sees everything, yeah? He, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Or even uh, his right hand, remember? You know, that how important for for the, the Hebrew culture, it was for the right hand to, you know, when, when it says, your right hand would uphold me, you know, that's, that's kind of like the, like, like goodness, 
You know, that, that was the important part. But if we, this doesn't mean that God has hands or arms. It's a figurative language. And, and notice, all of these verses are where? Psalms. And what is Psalms? Poems, right? They're, they're you know, it's poetry. Uh, so it's very important that when you look at Scripture, you need to look at not only just the context that we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks, but you need to look about, okay, what kind of literature am I looking at, right? What kind of literature am I looking at? Now, why is this dangerous, the, um, this huge problem with letterism? You might say, well, I don't have a problem with it. I'm pretty, you know, but you will encounter this. Okay, so why is it dangerous? Number one is because it doesn't take into account the authorial intent. And by that I mean it doesn't take into account the fact that David is writing poet, poetry or Moses is writing poetry or that there's actually a, an actual, when Jesus says, uh, you know, if your eye makes you stumble, pluck it out. He's talking about like a radical spiritual amputation, not you plucking out your eye, right? Um, so you're not respecting that. Number two is eisegesis, right? You're putting into the text what you think it means instead of letting the text speak. And number three, it really leads to confusion and heresy. Uh, it leads to confusion. It's heretical to say that, Jesus, that, that, that God is human, right? It's heretical to say that. Um, it's, it, it leads, um, soul sleep is not a heretical p- uh, position, but it's not a biblical position. Uh, and it leads to confusion, right? It leads to uh, complete confusion, saying, so wait a second, you mean to tell me Paul has been asleep for the last 2,000 years? What was his hope then? That he would just take a 2,000-year nap? Like, what, what, what is his hope? What is the hope of the resurrection? Um, what, what, what are we talking about, right? That leads, and together with letterism is legalizing, legalizing, um, or legalism, legalism. Um, so legalizing, um, what that means is it's basically, the, and how would you see it in action, is the book of Malachi. You remember when we went through the book of Malachi in our care groups? <laughs> We have one honest person. <laughs> one honest person. <laughs> Do you remember Malachi? Any of you? A little bit? One remembers? Anyone else? Chris taught the book of Malachi and he doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the book of Malachi about? Anyone kind of have a hint of it? What was going on? In Israel. Taylor, do you remember at all? <laughs> I'm going to stop calling on the care group leaders. <laughs> no, I think Parker was born. It was Parker's fault, yeah. <laughs> we'll blame Parker. She was born. Do you remember? It was basically the whole idea was Israel had come back from uh, where? Babylon, and they were obeying the Lord, right? No. Well, sort of, right? How were they obeying? Yeah, they had built the temple, sort of. They built the walls, sort of. But how were they, what was their religion like? What was it? It was all externals, remember? Remember? Their heart wasn't in it. They were keeping the law, keeping the law, but their hearts wasn't in it. And, and that, was, that was, you know, Malachi's beef with them. And actually, God, it was God's problem mainly. And, and he's confronting them because he's just saying, you're so good at keeping the letter. They were, they were filled with letterisms. And yet, you are stealing from me because you're not giving me, you know, what I'm due, the worship that I'm due, uh, when you're presenting, yeah, you're bringing your sacrifices, which is awesome, but really, you're actually, you're bringing the worst kind of sheep, and you're bringing, like, the, you know, the old lamb, the lamb, you're bringing the, everything, just, you're just doing everything from, you know, from, not from the heart, but from just an outward appearance. 
That is the best illustration of what legalizing is. And legalizing, really what it is, is the application of letterism. It's the application of letterism. Look at the definition there. So while letterism is an error of interpretation, legalizing uh, is a mistake that involves both interpretation and application. It involves overemphasizing the letter of God's word at the expense of his spirit. And we know this. This doesn't take you know, a rocket science to, to figure this out, right? Uh, the examples are the Pharisaical religion, religion of Jesus' time and even before, right? Just emphasizing the externals. Remember what Jesus says to them, right? You are tithing on the cumin. Uh, remember, he says that you're, you're doing this. You're, you're tithing on the thyme and all these spices. Like, who does that? Who, who does? Like, like, Jesus is like, he's surprised that they're doing that, and yet their heart is far away from the Lord. Like, you're doing this, and then when you get a little money, and you're supposed to help your parents, you're like, well, no, that's for the Lord. That's Corbin. You're doing something else. Like, I, I can't do that. I can't help you. I wish I could help you. I guess you're going to have to, you know, be hungry today because, you know, all the money I have is put in, you know, to the temple, to the Lord. And, and that's, and that's what, what's going on. Um, but then, so that's then. We can do this now with verses and find that and just be so into our passages. And say, well, that's what the Bible says. We're going to follow it. And obviously, I'm not advocating not doing what the Bible says, but just finding those, you know, laws in the Old Testament, and just say, well, that's for me, and obviously I can't do this, I can't watch TV, I can't do all of these things. Um, but then there is there is a movement out there, especially, I don't know if it's still around, uh, as strong as it was back when I was in seminary, which is the home church movement. And the home church movement is not all bad, they're not heretics, a lot of them are believers, but they will cling to Scripture uh, and those verses that you see right there to say the only way to go to church is in a home. Why? Well, because that's what, that's what the Bible calls us to do. That's what the Bible calls us to do. You know, in the early church, they were, we didn't have buildings. We were in we meeting in, in, in a building. They met in homes. So you and I need to meet in homes. And we need to have small groups, you know, and not, no big churches. Uh, usually there were networks that did this. And, and, and you need to have, uh, and another one with this was, you need to have meals together. So if you don't have meals together, and if you didn't meet at church, in homes, then, hey, you're not doing church the right way. I mean, tons of books came out. Tons of books came, came out in the early 2000s um, to the mid-2000s. Tons of books. Um, they basically advocated for this. Um, eventually, all of those churches ended up moving to buildings. Uh, <laughs> they became this huge network, and all of them are gone by, by now. Um, um, but, but, that, but that's what happens, right? You cling to one doctrine... And the application of that doctrine is, instead of just saying, hey, I kind of want to go to a home church. I think that's good for me. No, everybody needs to go to a home church. Um, and that's, you know, for, for me. And the application of it is this. And if you don't do this, then you're in sin. Can you think of any other example of Something that we might do, not what other people might, but that we, a danger for us. Small groups, yeah. Hey, our church does care groups. If you don't do a care group, maybe your church is not biblical. No, this, our elders have chosen that for our church, and that's great. Praise the Lord for that, right? We all benefit from that. But that doesn't mean that that's the only way. How about something else? Like, maybe, like, we, what are the preference? In education? This class. This class, <laughs> this class is required. <laughs> if you're not here, we have a problem. Like, homeschooling could be one of those things, right? Like, oh, well, we, you know, 
You can say as a family, well, we choose to homeschool, or we choose to do a hybrid program, or we choose to do a private school, or we choose to do, I'm going to say it, public school. Well, good for you. You know, that, that's great. You know, I, we, I don't have a problem with that. that that's great. I know I'm not the best example, but I went to public school. <laughs> and many of you went to public school, right? So, um, but again, that's one of those things where you can just find, yeah, but the Bible says that you, as a father, need to be in charge of your child's education. Yes. Yes, but you can do that in a public school. You can do that in a hybrid school, in a home school, and you can even do that in a private school. Uh, and you are, and there are people that don't do that in any of those schools, right? So it's up to the individual to do that. Um, and we can go on and on and on and on with our own uh, preferences. Um, why is it dangerous? Well, same thing, right? It doesn't take into account, uh, account the authorial intent, especially when it deals with the spirit of the law, of the, of the letter. Um, we just look at a passage and we just say, that's what it says. Well, it doesn't matter what it means. We're just going to do this. Um, it leads to, um, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's eisegesis. It's, you're doing whatever you want to do, <coughs> and you're putting in your ideas. And then finally, it leads to confusion and legalism. It actually leads to this legalist style. So if you look at, you know, not understanding the law of Moses, then you can just put on, look, you know, um, I remember um, uh, it's a Psalm 102, Psalm 101 that says, I will put no worthless thing before my eyes. And there's this family that I knew that didn't own a TV because of that passage. Though they did own Netflix and they watched it on their iPad. <laughs> but anyway, that's for another day. <laughs> but it's really interesting, right? Like, oh, that, that's the passage, but but only for the TV, but not for the... So then it becomes, again, you are a prisoner of your own convictions in the end, right? Of, if they're not coming out right out of Scripture, right? If your conviction is not to watch TV, praise the Lord for that, but don't make that on someone else. Um, any questions with these first two before we move to what we call reverse interpretation? Well, that's... I, I thought it was clear, too, so thank you, yeah. Uh, let's go to reverse interpretation. Um, and w there's two errors that I want to look at, and these two errors are, um, are generalizing and trying to experience the text. Um, so generalizing and experientializing or, or trying to experience the text. Um, so let's, let's go first with generalizing. Um, Mehu says, one of today's great threats to a correct interpretation of Scripture is assuming that any specific historical uh, experience reported in Scripture is valid, is a valid general experience for today. Meaning this, if a past... It, if you see something in scripture that happened, because God is immutable, because Malachi 3, 6 says that God doesn't change, then he will act in the same way today. So they would look at scripture, they would look at passages, and they would just say, oh yeah, um, just because you, see, because you see it in scripture, you will see it today. Um, it happens all over the Old Testament, and especially on narratives, right? Um, the perfect example of this is Pentecost. Um, people use language like this. They say things like, you know, we need to pray for a Pentecost. You know, if, if God can do it back then, why can he do it now? And, and that's what happened with the Azusa Street Revival, I think it was in 1906 uh, uh, in, in L.A., you know, they, it was a Pentecost here on the West Coast. Uh, but the Bible doesn't say that necessarily any of these things are going to happen. Um, the examples are this, is um, healings, right? Um, 
you know, or uh, resurrections. Uh, you see that in Scripture. Or miraculous providing, um, and, or, or even judgment, right? Um, so people would put pressure on healings, for example, saying, um, well, the Bible healed those who have faith. So obviously, you're not getting healed, so there's a problem here. Either you don't have enough faith or something is happening here. Now, what would you say to that? What would you say to that? If someone says, maybe not to you, but you hear some, that from someone, how would you say that? For example, you're looking at Acts chapter 3. And remember the healing of the lame beggar, right? And the person gets healed there. And he just said, you know, just like that person got healed. This is New Testament. You can't say that, oh, that was Old Testament. This is New Testament. Someone needs to be healed. So what, how would you explain that today? If you find someone who is not getting healed, someone who's sick. Take your time. What's that? God is sovereign, but he was sovereign back here too, and he healed them, right? We're not guaranteed in the healing in this life. Yeah, so what are you using there, Chris? What are, you're using something that we learned in this class. <laughs> Starts with a C. Yeah, he's using, he's using context. <laughs> it's so natural to him, he doesn't even know it. It just comes natural. Yeah, so you're using context, and, the, and you're using a literary context, right? What kind of script, what kind of literature are we reading? Yeah, historic. Narrative. And historical narrative is... Is it prescriptive? No, it's descriptive. It's describing something that is happening. And also, there's no passage in Scripture that says that you're going to be healed in its context, right? Um, and by the way, the beggar, did he have faith? Does he say that here? It doesn't say it, right? Actually, we know that he was looking to get something, right? You know, because he says, look at us. Uh, and he began to give them their attention, verse 5, 3, 5, expecting to receive something from them. And some people, oh, he was expecting to receive healing. Mm, I don't think so. He was hoping, yeah, he was a beggar. He was hoping to get a coin or two, right? He was hoping to get lunch from them. And he gets actually healing, right? So we know that, right? The same thing with resurrections, right? You see the resurrections in the Old Testament, the New Testament. You know, how would you answer that? It's just in the same way. Well, let's look at the passage. What was that resurrection doing? For example, we looked at the, uh, do you remember uh, in Acts, in Eutychus, right? Do you remember Eutychus in Acts? What happened to him? Yeah, it fell out of the window, Right? Yeah, three stories high. How high was that, Lynn, you told me? Well, 308.4 feet. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't survive. <laughs> we know that, right? He's dead. And Paul lays on, on him and then heals him, right? And you can say, oh, yeah. So, so in order for you to be resurrected in the passage, you need to have fallen from a third floor while listening to some good preaching, right? <clears throat> What is the point of that passage? What was that communicating about Paul and his ministry? There's that word again, the authenticating, remember? He, he's being, Paul is being authenticated as being in the same vein as like Peter and the Old Testament, you know, uh, prophets. So none of us are guaranteed any of that stuff. Now, 
That is not for us, for, 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 for us to think, oh, well, can God heal today? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is why we pray, right? We pray with faith that God can heal. He can do whatever he wants to do. But at the same time, when he doesn't heal, we're not thinking, oh, I certainly have done something. I certainly have sinned in a, in a, in a different way. Uh, mir- uh, or miraculous providing, right? Remember Elisha uh, or Elijah, both of them. Uh, Elijah is being, fed, is being fed by ravens. Um, we have some crows in our backyard. They come to eat the food that the kids leave out, not, not to leave any food. Um, I wouldn't eat the food they leave either. Uh, but think about that, right? God that not, not, doesn't necessarily mean... Again, look at the type of literature. Um, now, why is this dangerous, right? Um, even like, I, I wanted to say one more thing. Even judgment. Um, and I want to just pause for a second here. Sometimes we use the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we think, oh, look at our country, right? It's definitely heading for judgment. Um, we don't know that, <laughs> right? Uh, as much as we want it or don't want it, we don't know that. We are not Israel, right? Israel is Israel, um, and it's a different Israel than this one, <laughs> the one in the Old Testament. Uh, so, um, so just... Just think biblically about this. Uh, and don't try to pull Old Testament promises for America. Uh, and we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, why is this dangerous? Well, number one is because it doesn't take into account uh, the authorial intent, right? Uh, why was these passages written, right? Why was Jesus doing miracles? Why were the apostles doing miracles? Number two, it doesn't take into account the historical and cultural gap. Remember, there's a gap between us. There's a cultural, uh, there's, some, uh, there's a cultural gap uh, between us. You know, we don't live in the same time uh, that Elijah and Elisha were living, and so that we need to we need to take that into account. Number three, it, it leads to the eisegesis. We're putting our own ideas, our own preconceived ideas, uh, into the text. And, and final. Finally, it leads to confusion. It leads to like even heretical teaching of just saying that if God, if you're good enough, God will heal you. Nor in scripture that's said. Um, and, and the confusion is that what if God doesn't heal me? What if God chooses not to heal me? Um, you know, illness touches us all, right? So what if God chooses not to do something? Is he unfaithful? Are you unfaithful? Or what, how do you find yourself you know, following that? And then the, the last fallacy. Um, it's actually this idea of using Scripture as an experience. As an experience. Um, and it begins, really, the definition would be this. It began with a personal experience. You're using your own experience to authenticate scripture uh, and not the other way around, right? You are, you're not just looking at what happened to you and seeing, okay, I'm going to look through the grid of scripture if this is biblical or not. You're just saying, look, I had an experience. I've experimented this. So obviously it has to be biblical because I love the Lord. Um, um, and instead of using uh, our experiences to validate scripture, uh, our scripture validates actually our experiences. That's how it should be. Um, some examples of this, and this is, you might think, well, who does this? <laughs> well, this is one of those errors that, um, especially the charismatic movement and that experiential thing that we talked about, you know, some weeks ago, not many weeks ago, this is how they, they feed themselves in. Um, especially the charismatic moving, movement using acts, looking at those experiences and looking at what, what's going on with them and they're saying, oh, it's just like Paul. I'm kind of like the Paul here. I'm, I'm like an apostle of sorts. Um, yeah, look, I was talking to so-and-so and, and they listen. So obviously everything else I do is, is, is true. Um, using, for example, some personal experiences and, and look at David's trials 
and we think, oh yeah, you see, just like David, I'm going through all of these trials, and David was the king. I'm destined for great things. Um, if we had time, I could read to you some of the stuff I, I, I found on this. Um, um, uh, this subjective uh, discernment uh, that I found. Uh, tons of problems with this. Um, using Paul's and Peter's examples of discernment. Remember, Peter is talking to uh, Simon the magician, and he knows exactly what Simon you know, is saying. Or, or Paul is talking to Elymas, the magician also, uh, and he knows exactly, he confronts him. Uh, this, this movement would say the same thing. Well, they, there's a subjective discernment that comes, and not from Scripture, but it's just gifted to you. Uh, the same thing with those experiences. Those experiences are more important than Scripture themselves. Have you heard of that before? Anyone? Anyone grew up in that kind of... No? You did, Hannah? But you grew up in a church like that? Wow. Wow. You're talking about pastor of that church, I guess. Uh, I mean, this is very uh, prevalent in, in the Christian world. Um, even in the books that you find out there, right? Um, Pseudo-Christian books, like The Secret. Uh, have you heard of that book? The Shack. Yes, Fill with these things. Now you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, there's just pseudo-Christian books. They're just filled with these ideas of you know, experience. Uh, and then the scriptures actually, my experience are validating scripture. Now, what is wrong with this? Um, well, there's tons wrong, right? But number one, uh, it doesn't take into account authorial intent. Um, it looks at authorial intent as something that, you know, the Bible is just, remember, it's, it's, it's just disconnected pieces of, of Scripture. Um, and they would say, all of these people would say, yeah, the Bible is the Word of God, but they don't use it as the Word of God. They use it just as a, like a fortune cookie, right? You'll have a great day. Oh, okay, great. And then you get the lot of numbers on the other side. Um, uh, it doesn't take into account the historical and cultural gaps. Again, scripture, special narratives were written for a specific, you know, reason. Remember what we talked about yesterday, um, last week, right? Scripture was written uh, for us, not to us, right? And the difference is the scripture was written in a particular place to a particular people. And yes, we are beneficiaries of scripture. It was written for us, but not to us directly. Leads to eisegesis again, and it leads to to confusion. And actually, having these these um, these views uh, lead to to confusion. Next week, uh, what I want to do, and we'll end here, um, not to belabor the point. Uh, next week, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, something which is very good, which are word studies, uh, but. If it's not used right, it's like a monkey with a grenade. Uh, The whole thing will explode. Um, So next week we're going to talk about word studies and the errors that come from studying words and not understanding uh, how to study the words, how to apply the word studies. So let me pray for us. Uh, If you have any questions, I'm here. After you want to yell at me, I'm, I'm here. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. Keep us from um, not looking at your word as we should. Um, The inerrant, infallible, um, inspired, authoritative, sufficient word of God. So help us to see it uh, as that and help us to be thankful for it. Help us to read scripture, uh, not just to make up our own ideas, but to really see what you want um, our lives to be like. So we're thankful we worship you and help us this morning to go to our service, to sing our heart out for you, to even hear your word and be challenged by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you, guys.